Okay, so hello everyone. Um, we're going to break the barriers of technology today and actually do an OpenStack presentation over Skype. So, uh, my name is Iran, I'm from IBM Research, and with us over Skype is Alberto Messina. Alberto? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> hello everyone. Uh, I have to apologize because uh, I would have very much liked to be with you there in Paris, but unfortunately my son decided to pass me a virus, and so this happens with small children. And so I, I'll do this via Skype. Okay, so we're going to talk about Docker Meet Swift, the broadcaster's experience. What we're going to talk actually about is... Um, Alberto, do the magic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what we're actually going to talk about is how to move the media workflow near the storage or near, or near where the data is. So we're going to first uh, start by saying what that means. Um, then Alberto would, say, would, would elaborate on why we want to do that and give a demo. And then I'll go and, and try to look under the hood of what actually happened there. So moving the data near the storage basically means Moving, I'm sorry, moving the workflow of the media, uh, the media workflow near the data actually means collocating compute inside storage. And to do that, we're going to use what we call a Docker-powered Swift cluster. Um, so an important thing to say here is that when you are going to run untrusted code from external user inside your storage system, you want it to be sandboxed, right? And by Docker-powered Swift cluster, we're actually uh, using Linux containers to do the sandboxing. And as I'll show next, we also, of course, make use of the Docker uh, functionality to distribute and to um, actually manipulate images, etc. So, Alberto, if you can uh, move us to the next slide, please. So, just few terminology items before I hand it over to Alberto who would talk why do you want to do that, etc. So um, here are some um, terms we're going to use, a storelet. So a storelet is essentially the computation that runs inside the Swift cluster. Think about a piece of code that does filtering, transform, uh, transforming, or whatever. And this storelet, as I've mentioned, is going to be executed inside a Docker container as we want sandboxing. Storlet Engine. Storlet Engine is the software that invokes a storlet which runs inside a Docker image, and it uh, basically takes care of connecting all the input and outputs to the compute. Um, then in the demo, we'll, we will also mention Metadata Search, with this, which is a Swift extension that basically provides the ability to look for objects according to their Swift metadata. So with that said, I'm transforming over to Alberto, who will talk about this from the media side. Yeah, thank you very much, Iran. So, uh, yeah, what does all this mean in the current uh, media domain? So, we, we are actually facing a couple of challenges recently. Uh, maybe not all of you know that Rai is the Italian public broadcaster, but um, so uh, these, these are some of the things that we are currently investigating, not only as a research, but also from the let's say from the industrial perspective, so first of all, uh, what we are seeing more and more is the increase of content quality. This means not only resolution, so not only uh, switching from standard definition to high definition to ultra high definition, but also frame rate and dynamic range, which are also parameters that increase the quality quite a bit. If you have experienced those. Um, the other thing that we are uh, facing is the increase of distribution and publication channels. Like, for example, digital terrestrial satellite, which are, say, okay, commonplace, but uh, internet and mobile are more and more uh, becoming uh, of the same importance for media companies as the traditional broadcasting perspective. Together with this, there is another key element, which is the restoration and digitization of archives. And this means millions of hours, really uh, millions. So uh, this, this, of course, introduces a lot of uh, problems related to the, how to store, how to manipulate, how to process all these digital media. Uh, in this context, management of media is becoming, of course, critical for at least three aspects. First one is quality assurance, 
and enforcement, so being able also to uh, enforce that a certain quality level is met. Then second, content accessibility. So we are talking about millions of hours. Uh, so we have to be able to access this content rapidly. And last but not least, definitely, is the storage and processing capability that has to uh, grow uh, at the same pace. So let me give an example of, of this, which is rather simple, but at the same time, very important. Loudness. What is loudness, first of all? Is the perceived oral energy of an audio signal. Uh, it is different from several other ways to measure an, uh, audio energy, like, for example, RMS, because it takes into account uh, psychophysiological aspects. So on the right side of this slide, you see the, uh, uh, the ISO 226 um, curves that uh, say illustrate how the human hearing system is sensible to different frequencies with different um, with different magnitude. So this means that loudness of an audio signal has to be measured, taking into account this. So this is a very important quality parameter for broadcasting because, uh, of course, you don't want your audience to be shocked by a sudden change of loudness level. Uh, in both directions. So um, around this topic, a lot of work has been done from the normative perspective. And so uh, a lot of specification exists in, uh, in this domain. Uh, one of the most um, prominent uh, standardization body in this case is ITU. But together with ITU, also the EBU, which is the European Broadcasting Union, also provided uh, quite a, a list of uh, uh, technical provisions to uh, make industry uh, and users aware how to measure and how to assess whether audio signals are in the admitted range for uh, a certain level of quality. So loudness is a very important thing. But what is the problem then? Uh, I mean, it is a very simple to understand. It's just measuring some energy of an audio signal in some, in some way. The problem is that Programs are not normalized uh, to the admitted uh, level of loudness. So you can really get uh, whatever level. Uh, this, this is because of several reasons, for the fact, simply for the fact that programs and media are produced by different parties. So these apply different criteria. And so this loudness measurement and normalization is not yet, let's say, uh, uh, accepted worldwide. So this may cause very serious quality problems at the client side because if you are um, uh, if you are uh, someone who's hearing to a, to a television program and then suddenly this changes to an advertisement spot, then if the loudness is not normalized and aligned, you yourself you could have experienced some some let's say annoying effect. And this is something that we don't want. We want to have a, a let's say a a normalize a, a uniform loudness measurement, a loudness level for our broadcasting channels. Uh, this, of course, also implies uh, issues in the media production because you have to check the conformance of these files when they are ingested, when you, for example, purchase new content or when you digitize your archive. And you have also to check conformance after editing, because if you edit content uh, with a, for example, with an editing machine, you don't have 100% assurance that the loudness is treated appropriately. So you have to check also uh, uh, that loudness is okay after editing. So uh, to do this, uh, as it is illustrated briefly on the right side of the slide, uh, there is a specific uh, meter that is called LUFS, uh, a loudness unit uh, full scale, which is the, uh, the unit with which we measure loudness. And we have to uniform the loudness, the integrated loudness value to this, to this, um, to this parameter to be sure that the quality is okay. So then, uh, I say, which, which is the, the scenario, the, the typical uh, technical scenario in which we are, is that of file staging. So file staging is basically having different sources of, uh, of, of material, of digitization, trading and purchase, or international feeds. And everything goes into a file staging area where files are, are, are put for processing, for being processed. And this includes quality checks, metadata extraction, and transcoding. 
So uh, in the demo that I'm going to show, there will be three steps. Um, so the first will be about file ingest, the second file check, and the third one, loudness renormalization. So this will be around this, this use case. And we are developing this, uh, this demo. We have used uh, the system's core functionalities as Iran has introduced a few minutes ago. So the solids and uh, the ability to find objects based on metadata. So let me switch to the, uh, um, to the, to the console. What we have seen here is uh, the console of the system. So I, I, I log in with, uh, with my colleague, uh, username and password and um, what I see as a first uh, screen is a list of, of what we call projects so a project for that for us is the unit of production so a project could be an editing project or a transcoding project if you want to transcode media or a simple ingestion project uh, behind each of these projects uh, a, con uh, a container in the Swift uh, um, backend exists. So we use containers, the Swift containers, to implement projects. So let's let's open one of these. Uh, and what happens is that, for example, there are uh, already some files here. You see that the extension of this file is MXF. So MXF is the material exchange format, which is the professional format for media exchange. And in this in this um, in this dashboard, I can do everything with these files, including, for example, uh, searching by metadata, deleting stuff, and so on. Let's, let's, for example, uh, delete a couple of a couple of items. I do this because I want to reinsert the same items to the demo. <laughs> okay, so what I uh, I can do is, for example, upload new uh, new files. Uh, let's, uh, for example, use this five seconds uh, MXF file. Uh, which is somewhere on the network, and I want to upload this file because, for example, someone has, has bought in, uh, this, this, this program in my company, and so I have to check if this program is, uh, is correct from the loudness point of view. So I uh, upload this, this file. Let's hope that this is working. Okay, yes, after a few seconds, this, this is on. So uh, we are talking here of a data rate of 50 megabits per second. So the uh, master quality for production is 50 megabits per second. So something which is quite unusual in the, let's say, normal internet distribution of content. Uh, as you have seen, uh, the upload of this file has been quite quick. So this means that the system is, uh, has a very good network, for example. So let's refresh the, the situation. Okay, here it is. So if I go here, um, what happens is that while I'm putting this file on the con in the container, already a first couple of storelets uh, have run. The first one is a storelet which extracted the technical metadata of the file. So something like expert ratio, the number of audio channels, uh, the depth of the components, a lot of other parameters like height, width, and so on. So these parameters have been extracted by a storelet at the same time that the content uh, was uh, being uploaded in the container. So there was a storlet which was reading the stream, the incoming stream, calculating the metadata, and finally writing the file and the metadata in the container. Uh, as you see here, we have a value of uh, loudness, that is integrated loudness, which value is minus 20. So the normative value should be minus 23. So this means that this file has an extra 3 dB of loudness, which can be, let's say, critical. Uh, because if I if I edit this file together with other content, then I may I may feel a, a mismatch. I may feel a, a step which could be annoying in the in the loudness in the lowest uh, level of this file. So I have to normalize this in this in, in some way. So imagine that we don't have just one file, but we we have maybe 100, 200 files. So the first thing to do is being able to search all the files that have that problem. So I search for integrated uh, loudness float greater than, for example, uh, minus 23. Okay. So what happens? Okay, I find I find two objects. In this case, I used the, the uh, metadata based search of the uh, Swift uh, backend, and so I found these two files. Uh, this one which has been uploaded beforehand, and this one which has been just uploaded. So I open this, uh, so I look again at the metadata just to check, okay, it is minus 20, the same as before. So what I do, 
uh, I can do an action here to uh, normalize the loudness of this file. I launch this, and what in the backend, what is happening? Another storelet, which is the uh, loudness normalization storelet, has downloaded the uh, object from the backend Swift, calculated and renormalized the audio level, and saved a new file which with uh, uh, with the right loudness parameter. So this should be, um, if this has worked, I should be uh, seeing in the metadata list that now the uh, integrated loudness is uh, minus 23. So actually the file has been normalized. Uh, I had also a nice um, a way to um, to show this. Uh, maybe maybe uh, not all uh, the audience will notice the difference. But if I have if I play uh, the file before normalization. So we can't yeah. hear that. But um, is there any indicator we should be looking at? Yeah, this this should be the the indicator should be the. Uh, these bars here. You see these bars? Yep. Uh, basically, this. Okay. So if I open the normalized one, these bars should be normally lower. Okay. Normally. <laughs> Maybe this is, this is not really. <laughs> this is not really an an exceptional uh, level because it's just 3 dB. But, but uh, there are cases in which this difference is much higher. And we can find files, for example, with a minus 10 uh, loudness uh, level, which is really, really loud. And so we have really to, um, uh, to adjust this. Otherwise, we have problems. So this was basically the demo. So uh, I can switch back to the presentation, give the floor uh, back to Iran to explore uh, the details of what I've been uh, demonstrating. OK, thank you, Alberto. I'll, I'll I'll need your help clicking. So let's move to the next, I think. Oh, OK, right. So <clears throat> I'll first try to explain what is a Docker-powered Swift cluster. So I'll need a click here. So a Docker-powered Swift cluster is, first of all, a Swift cluster. We can see the proxy layer. We can see the storage layer. Then it is augmented with click. with um, Docker. And also, we have a Docker registry, a private registry. I'll show next how do we use that. And then another click. This is like a, now, a, a year of work is, is appearing in a click now. We have two pieces of middleware, which is basically the Storlet engine. We have a middleware on the proxy layer, and then a different middleware on the object servers. You can, you can tell the difference by the colors. Um, another click. Um, OK. So, so once again, a Docker-powered Swift cluster is a Swift cluster with Docker and our pieces of middleware. So far, we've been talking about running storlets inside the Swift cluster. Namely, we're bringing code from the outside to be running inside Docker containers running on the sto storage system. However, a very basic functionality here would be to allow the user also control the underlying image where the storlet runs. So in our case, for example, there has been a, um, a usage of FFmpeg to actually code those toilets. So what I'm going to talk about now is how does the flow of the user updating the image where his toilets are going to run is working. So imagine that we have this setup. Um, we've got um, Docker deployed with, with images that currently consists only of Ubuntu 14.04 and, and the Storlet stuff. We don't have the FFmpeg yet there. These are the uh, small squares that are drawn here. Um, so this is the basic image that we provide, and we have an image pair Swift account. OK? So now we want to, uh, the, um, the Swift account manager, which is basically the customer of the provider, wants to. Um, um, to add FFmpeg to that. So first thing he does, he does a Docker pull out of the registry. He gets the default um, image, which is basically Ubuntu 14.04 and, and our storage stuff, the stuff that needs to run in the Docker, si in the Docker container side. And then using uh, standard um, Docker tools, Docker file for those of you who are familiar with that, he adds FFmpeg on top of it. 
then a click would actually demonstrate a Docker push to the repository. And then the Swift Storlet Manager, which on the provider side, needs to deploy that to the um, Swift nodes. So what's nice about Docker here is that if we already have the base images deployed, we only need to deploy the layer of FFmpeg. This is one of the nice features we get from, um, from Docker. So once the FFmpeg uh, is there, we can actually go and run Storlet that uses it inside it. So let's move on to the next slide and talk a little bit about how to write a Storlet and how to deploy it. So writing a Storlet is extremely easy. You basically need to um, inherit from uh, an interface. We currently support uh, Java-based Storlets, but it's fairly easy to add any other language binding, C, Python, well, Fortran might be problematic. Um, once if we, if we have a quick look at that, uh, at that um, API, we see that we've got in-streams. This is where the data would stream in into the storlets. We have out-stream. This is um, the streams where the storlets could um, push back or send back the computation results. We have parameters, of course, and we have a logger. So once we've got this written, um, the user can, the developer can uh, pack it into a jar. Let's have a click there. And basically upload it as a regular Swift object into a designated container. Here is the put. Um, here is how the put looks like. So we do an, um, an HTTP put um, to a container named Storlet under the account 111 in this case, and this is the name of the, the Storlet. MXF Technical MD Extraction sto Extractor Storlet. This is the Storlet that was used in the demo during the ingest mode, where during the upload uh, it extracted the MXF functional features and place them as Swift metadata. OK, so we've, and from there, when the storlet will be asked to be executed on a certain node, our middleware will fetch it from there and will execute it inside the Docker container. We'll see that in a minute. So let's move on to the next part. So this is running and deploying a storlet. So now I'm going to talk about how to invoke storlets. So there are three ways I'm talking. This is the first way that I'm going to talk about is during put. Again, in the demo, what we've seen is um, that during the put of the MXF file, we've extracted those metadata features and put them as Swift, um, as Swift metadata. The general case would be that we, don't, that we want to upload some data, but this is not the data that we want to actually save inside the storage system, but rather we want to save a transformation of it. Okay? This would be the general case for invoking a storage on put or to enrich its metadata. right? Um, think of encryption, compression, transcoding, whatever that you want to do before you save, the, you save the data as an object in Swift. So um, telling the system that you want to sto the storage to run there is extremely simple. Simply add this header to the put request saying xrun storlet and the name of the storlet as it was uploaded in the previous slide. Um, so <coughs> let's do, um, if I Alberto, a click would help now. OK, so now we're zooming into, into the proxy server, right? So we've done a put. The put hit the proxy server, and now we're inside the proxy server. On the left-hand side, we see our middleware. On the right-hand side, we see the Docker with the image uh, per the um, account that the request was made to. So first of all, we intercept the request. Then a click. Um, we're <coughs> what basically happens now is, is that we establish a connection with the actual Docker container for that account. One thing to say here is that on the first, um, when we first, for the f when, when we run the storage for the first time on that node, we're gonna invoke or spawn a daemon inside that Docker um, container that will wait for additional requests. So we don't need to um, spawn new container or spawn new processes where new requests are coming. We do, we're doing it only for the first time. All right, so we've invoked the daemon, we've made the connection, we now pass the input and output of these. So the point to make here is that the Docker container is completely isolated. No block devices, no network devices, nothing. All the data is being streamed in and out by those file descriptors that we pass here from our middleware to the um, container. Let's click on. So the Stoller does whatever it does, in our case, um, it looked at the MXF file 
extracted those metadata stuff, and then he sends back the metadata and the object data stream, which is basically exactly what was uploaded if we're thinking about the demo, right? We just extracted additional metadata, and then we just complete the proxy put flow with no other changes. So this data is going to be replicated and all the, good, all, all the things that had needs to happen on a put path in Swift. Right, so let's move to the other use case or the other way to um, invoke stallets. So <clears throat> in this case, we invoke the stallet upon get. So in the, in the demo, this was where we actually calculated the loudness feature. So we've done it upon get. Whenever we got the, we, we asked to do get plus this extra install it loudness calculator install it, what actually we got back was this loudness value. But in the general case, this would be when you want to, um, you, you're not interested in the actual data be saved on the, on the Swift um, storage system, but rather you want the transformation over it. So again, um, examples might be, again, decompression, compression, de-encryption, whatever. Um, an example that we've been playing a lot is um, anonymization. Think about a use case where you, are, where you have um, medical records inside those objects and you want to de-identify them before they're being downloaded for a research or something. So this is, again, something that can be done with a stallet upon get. This is like a classical case. Right, so let's see what happens <coughs> in the get scenario. So the request hits the proxy server the proxy server, as it does with any GET request, is looking up a storage server where, where there is a replica of the object. Once he finds such a, <coughs> such a server, the request is being routed to that server. Again, nothing new here so far. Um, let's click, and now we're going to zoom in into the storage node. Right, so once again, the um, object server middleware on the left-hand side, the Docker container on the right-hand side, we intercept the request. Uh, for those of you who have more deep familiarity with Swift, we basically intercept the request after the object server application ran. So basically, we're getting the content of the object. We intercept the request when it's on its way back. So we already have the data there. We over already have a stream that with the data of the object. That's like side comment. Um, so once again, Similar to the put, uh, we invoke the daemon if needed. Uh, we pass the, the FDs. Um, the stallet sends back the object metadata and data. In this case, by the way, all we passed back was the um, loudness um, um, number. And we continue with the get flow as if it was just a regular get. OK, so let's move on to the uh, third way to invoke stallets which is on a post. So in the get scenario and in the put scenario, we were actually acting on the object that appeared in the URI, right? In the put scenario, we, we went and created an object according to what was there in the URI. In the get scenario, we were looking at the object that was in the URI. Here, we can actually invoke, uh, we can actually act on, on one object or more that are already inside the system. We can run a toilet over them and that storage actually can, um, can create other objects as a result of that. So a typical body uh, would look like execute the loudness normalization storage over um, the 15 seconds MXF, which resides in the demo um, project container, and place the output inside the demo project container. And in fact, we can, in, in that body, we can list more than one object in which case there will be a stallet instance running per object that is listed there. And we can even do this for um, different stallets. Right. Um, so what would happen here is that the proxy... Oh, oh, one, one, one on back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, the proxy tier would get the request, would parse it, would understand how many invocation of stallet it needs to, it needs to be done. And in this case, there are three invocations. It's not... It's like... An, an, Optionally, there can be more than one, as I've mentioned, and it forwards three requests to three different object servers, okay? So don't, don't get confused. There is only one, um, one, one uh, object that I've mentioned in the body here, but the errors shows as if I've actually um, placed there three. Okay. So um, 
Next slide, please. So I guess a lot of people in the audience are asking, okay, what about zero VM? So I'm sure many of you are aware of zero VM, uh, which is, by the way, a very cool project, um, which I really like. And um, so what's the difference? So I'll, I'll talk about two aspects here. One aspect, of course, is the underlying sandboxing technology. So um, the zero VM guys are using uh, the Google Knuckle-based zero VM, which basically means that anything that you want to run inside that sandbox needs to be compiled in a specific tool chain um, that probably gives you more security. Um, on the other hand, using Docker containers, there is much more flexibility in the ability to um, use off-the-shelf uh, software stack. You can put it on the image of the Docker container and then write something in Java or in Python, which I think makes life a lot more easier for developers. So <clears throat> I'll be out of my league if I'll try to compare like the security features of, each of, 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 of both technologies. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, rep I'll end here my first comment regarding zero VM. The next comment I have about zero VM is that they've, they've really, I think they've done a, a really nice engineering work in actually turning Swift into a compute platform. They can actually, um, they can actually make requests that are being translated to a whole workflow between stall it or between, in their case, it's zero VMs that can communicate and sort of doing a pipeline. They can do MapReduce jobs with that. It's really nice. And although this is something that we can do, I mean, there is no like theoretical or, or any reason that I can think of why we can't do that here. We do believe that, uh, that we probably need a slightly different model. It, I'm not completely sure that we want such a flow to actually run inside a Swift cluster. This, this also v changes a lot in the runtime behavior of Swift. Starting lots of threads, they need to communicate, et cetera, et cetera. It might be that this orchestration actually needs to be done outside of Swift in a way that also by the, that allows to use maybe other compute resources or being able to run um, analytic work, which, is, which would take data not only from uh, Swift, but perhaps also from, I don't know, Hadoop, um, traditional databases, whatever. So this is what I had to, what I had to say about um, storage and zero VM. Um, perhaps we'll jump to the um, next slide uh, about future plans. Um, so we want to make this um, available for experimentation. Um, if anyone is interested or, or wants more, more information, is welcome to contact either Alberto or myself. These are our emails. Uh, surely we want to increase the number of toilets, introducing more processing step to produce metadata and build an advanced um, search application on them. Continue to enrich the metadata prototype um, with additional storage based workflows. So um, Alberto believes that we do need workflows there, so <laughs> I might be wrong here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before, before I'll, I'll jump to... Um, to take questions, I, I want to uh, thank the technical staff here. It was very helpful with setting up the Skype um, and, and setting this all up. So thank you very much to the technical team. And I'll be very happy if you have questions. <coughs> right, so the, the question was um, how we did the metadata search implementation. So. Um, it's, it's, it's two pieces of middleware. One of them would, um, would take the Swift metadata as it flows in and, and send it to, um, to what's, what's, what's the name of the database? I don't remember, to, to some kind of database. And then there is another middleware that would intercept search requests and go to that database and, and fetch the answer. OK, there was, yep, John. Docker uh, container running for everyone in the Swift account, or 
Correct. I have. I, no, I have. No, I have it. I have it per account. We're not sure that this is the right decision, but on the other hand, we have no like real life experience, so we're starting with that. So you're going to have a Docker container running for each account, and each account is going to have their uh, a Unix pipe socket through which we can do all the magic. That is correct. And, and the nice thing about Docker is that I if you as a provider are going to limit the number of the distros you're going to support, then you're going to use, you're going to do, you're going to reuse the underlying um, layers of the Docker images, right? So, so if you were concerned about the storage resources that you're going to use there, so this is kind of on the upside. More questions? Yes. Yes, actually, it's an array of input stream and output stream, but I kind of simplified it here. So, yeah. uh, so can we uh, go back and forth in the output stream? Is it possible to run? What do you mean by you? you oh, you mean by uh, random random access? Yeah. Right. So, <clears throat> in some okay, so in some cases you can do that. In other cases, you cannot do that. Um, with the current prototype, you can't do this at all. But but potentially. With the input stream of the object, you can probably do that because under the hood, actually, there is a file descriptor of a file there, right? The file that actually holds within Swift the object, which is um, run, can be random accessed. But of course, the output cannot be because this is going to be streamed into the response that's going to uh, go back to the user on the socket. Right, so, uh, e so I should have said that this is, of course, uh, tailored for stream processing, right? If you want to um, merge sort a file, that's, that's not the right tool to do that. Yeah, so the application which came to my mind was uh, uh, QMO has a compression, so uh, where you can't uh, directly stream the output, mm -hmm. so where you need to go back and forth in the output stream to finally generate the uh, image. <coughs> Right, so in fact, so this is kind of an open question between ourselves. Um, we haven't blocked the ability to create local files, right? But then it, for me, it seems to defeat the purpose. I mean, if you're going to write a local file and then stream it back there, so you basically done nothing. You can, at the same, I mean, it would, probably take the same latency to just download the file and do this on the client side. I, you kind of missed the whole purpose here. This, anyway, this is the way I see it. Okay, so probably need to give this more thought. Yes, John. And the only way to go through is right now using the <laughs> yes, and unfortunately, to be honest, you probably won't get a very fast answer saying, okay, go ahead tomorrow, you can start playing with it. It would take us some time. We're having some internal difficulties. We don't want to get into that now. <laughs> so, <laughs> The open source question, of course. Yeah, I'm ready for that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let, let us separate. Let, let us first separate between the question of open source and the question of making this available for experimentation. It's not the same thing, right? Okay. So the open source question again, a very delicate uh, issue. It's being in internal con uh, internal uh, conversation within IBM. I cannot, unfortunately, I cannot say anything, and I, I don't have any any good news at this point, um, and I cannot elaborate, of course. And this is a time where I switch to my own personal view, <laughs> where I say that, personally, I would love to open source it. I would love to, to build a community around it. I would love to collaborate with ZeroVM on, on converged um, APIs, 
But again, this is out of my hands. Hopefully, before that, we'll have a positive answer, but then again, I really do not know. <laughs> yes? Um, can you talk about erasure coded uh, and how, where the compute would happen once you have? Right, so, um, <clears throat> in fact, <laughs> yeah, we've discussed this uh, just uh, an hour ago uh, with the erasure code team here. So, um, I think that, okay, so, <laughs> I think that there, there is more than one answer here. So the, the short answer would be, OK, we're going to switch to do all the processing on the proxy, where the, um, where the, where the erasure coding uh, code has reconstructed for us the file, and we pay for an extra hop here uh, on the internal network. That's the um, easy answer. I guess the more complex answer is that if you're using um, a systematic code, and you somehow know where the data really resides, you can, and, and you can distribute your storlets to probably work independently on each chunk, then you can probably do something. Another observation is um, maybe you can start with a storlet. Never mind. OK, let's, that, that <laughs> these are the two answers I have right now. I, I actually, I brought this question in, in, in the Zero VM Design Summit uh, last time. And the answer was, let's not worry about it now. But then it's going to be real soon, so perhaps we should start worry about it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the same answer goes here, right? So we can either move it to the proxy code, or if you're smart enough to know how your chunks looks like, you can get from the assembly object where they are and actually go and run the storage on each of the chunks, and then probably combine the um, the answers. So, um, so you talked about the problem surrounding open source uh, and op op in the middle there, so it's all the same thing, right? But one thing I found interesting uh, as, as more code is written, the capability to, the, to do the model work, is that something that you'd be willing to kind of contribute back? <laughs> I'm afraid that the little I've said about the storage, I can't even say about that. So, <laughs> so the, the uh, so I, I wasn't part of the team that actually developed this, this and so I really don't want to say anything. You know, I have a philosophical question. Everything that you say here can be done outside the network system, like OAuth, right? Mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you look for this specific kind of disk doing this job well, you don't want to miss the mandate to tell the computer to do it, right? I mean, because basically what you say here can be done Okay, but then the but right. So so Alberta, did you get the, the question? Uh, well, <clears throat> I heard the question, but I'm, I, I have my voice turning back. Maybe it's a uh, mic. Okay. So I heard the terms of the question, but I'm not really sure to have understood that. So I, I, I so. guess the, I'll try to, to rephrase that. Or Okay. So I, I guess the question is, why go and complicate Swift adding all these functionality where you can probably um, run this alongside of Swift? Um, Perhaps in, in inside the data center or even on the client side, or you were referring to inside OpenStack before the, before the okay. So to ha basically, why not have ah, okay. a layer on okay. top of Swift that does that? Got which yeah, got that, got that. So there is a, I think there is a, a good reason for doing this because uh, uh, metadata enrichment, uh, which is a category of processing steps, uh, loudness normalization is one, but there are many others is not something that starts and ends, uh, let's say, when you have the file, and then you forget. It is something that really uh, uh, comes in again and again during that content life cycle. So actually having, uh, say, stored 
uh, these bulky files in, in an object store like Swift and from time to time on demand extract new kinds of metadata is something which is really uh, day by day in media production. So actually you don't have a one shot metadata extraction and forget and store, but is a very uh, lively and continuous operation of metadata extraction. So it is really important to have the stuff stored there ideally forever and just make uh, the code run and extract the new metadata as they are available, as the new algorithms uh, arise, as maybe you, you, can, you can just rerun the same metadata extraction with a new tool because of as a better quality or as a better performance. And so this is something that really happens uh, day by day. So content is not really dead once it is uh, elaborated, but it continues to be uh, processed, uh, accessed, and enriched. So may, maybe I can add it on top of that. Um, so we had earlier a talk about um, uh, Swift and, and um, I need help. What was it? Swift and Spark, thank you. <laughs> so the point there was that you can basically filter a lot of the data that Spark actually, okay, you got it. Okay, thank you. Okay, are we out of time? Any more questions? Let me. I think if there are more questions, I think we can. All right, so thank you. And thanks again to the technical team. <laughs> Alberto, thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, you all.